Uh, more importantly, I think he has tried to talk about the complexity of politics and the deep implications of policy. Any man who can work with Aruna Roy for years deserves a long service medal. And in that sense, the right to information in a deep way is also one of his contributions. He can't patent it, so I'm delighted. Today, Harsh is going to speak. I have a feeling his secret rival is going to be a chap called Arvind Kejriwal. <laughs> Kejriwal simplifies and therefore says, I am. Harsh Mandar complicates and therefore he says, I am also there. <laughs> this battle of two futures is going to be interesting. Because in a deep and fundamental way, I haven't heard Arvind Kejriwal talk about poverty, development, sustainability. About the whole travails of how do you create a democratization of democracy. Which talks about marginality, which talks about futures which talks about equity, not in the way Monte Calabari and Yang do. We can allow for that kind of illiteracy on behalf of government. We can't do it. But I think that's where it comes in. As a man who's been an IAS officer, and a dissenting one, an NGO, and an equally dissenting one, and now heading the Center for Equities, where he can only dissent with himself, I present Harsh. Uh, you have 50 minutes. And after that, I think we can uh, be a bit frank about the questions you were asked. Thank you, Shiv, and uh, friends, thank you. I was clearing an empty hall, uh, so it's nice to see all of you here today. Um, <clears throat> Amartya Sen asked uh, in his book the idea of justice, a very interesting question, which is, uh, which is that injustice has been integral to every human character. But the search for the effort, the struggle to make society more just is also a universal feature of human society in collectives. And he asks, what is it in human nature? Just at the end of his book, uh, what is it in human nature which makes this search for a more just society universal? And he points to three things. And my, my, my talk is about the first. He says the three things in human nature which makes the search for justice universal, the first of these is empathy. And he talks about two other things, equally important. Uh, the second is, uh, is, is reason, and the third is uh, the love of freedom. Uh, empathy, what is empathy? You know, we sometimes talk about love, we talk about compassion, Compassion is a, is a wonderful word, but sometimes misleading. I prefer calling it egalitarian compassion. It's a compassion between equals. Empathy, to my mind, involves firstly uh, uh, an act of imagination. I need to imagine what a person who is very different from me, differently placed from me, experiences. And then it is an act of feeling. I feel that person's pain. I feel that person's humiliation. Uh, uh, I feel that person's joy. So, uh, so empathy. Yeah. Uh, and for many reasons, uh, I, I do believe that uh, that empathy is at the heart of building a more just, humane, caring society. And it is the it is actually the foundation of a just and caring state. And, and my talk is going to be about failures in empathy, in our empathy, in the Indian middle class. Uh, almost exactly a year ago, just, just, just about four days from now, uh, a year ago, uh, you all know there was an act of great brutality uh, at a location actually just within a couple of kilometers of where I live, uh, which in many ways uh, I think has changed uh, the Indian middle class in significant ways. Uh, when the young woman, uh, you know, the day the young woman died, uh, I had gone with my wife and, and my daughter to them for month. And uh, I, I was really struck when I looked around at the faces of young people who had gathered there, sitting around candles. They were actually mourning uh, her, her passing. 
in a way that you mourn the loss of somebody you love very deeply. And I thought it was an extraordinary moment because uh, somebody whose name we did not know, somebody whose face we didn't know, uh, her suffering, uh, her, the, her brutalization, and finally her passing was something that we collectively felt was our uh, was our collective tragedy. And I do believe that it was a very special moment of public empathy. And yet, uh, when I felt uh, felt felt. Uh, felt a moment of hope uh, uh, in that display of... And incidentally, actually, the linkage with justice was very clear because it was public empathy uh, which drove people to demand a more just system of laws. Uh, and uh, the government had to respond and set up the committee and the laws were changed and we hopefully would have previous state justice arising from that moment of public empathy. But uh, I'm also struck, I uh, was struck at that time by the limits and the frontiers of our empathy. I was struck uh, by, I work with homeless people, uh, and homeless women in particular. I don't think there's any person who lives in this country who is more subjected to recurring sexual violence than homeless women. Uh, in the first chapter that we opened with for homeless women, I was sitting with them and asking, what has changed most in your life? And one woman said, you know, it is after 17 years, for the first time, when I close my eyes at night, I know that I will pass the night without somebody waiting me. And, uh, you know, God forbid, uh, I'm a man, I can't even understand you know, whatever empathy I might, might, might claim, what exactly happens when you suffer sexual abuse. But the women in this room, if ever have, have, they have suffered one, God forbid, act of sexual violence, it scars them for life. Can we even begin to imagine 17 years of unending sexual abuse for which there's no end, there's no, no one cares, we never had a candlelight march uh, for the women who we see every day on the streets. Uh, going further, uh, you know about Dalit women, the, the violence that they suffer. We, 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 Gujarat, where both Shiv and I have, have worked, uh, the stories of sexual violence were so brutal. Uh, I, 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 I won't describe them here, but I always recall this story about a group of women activists who had gone to the fact finding. And this little boy of mine kept saying, I want to tell you, I, I know what rape is, but what is it? I want to tell you. And they said, yeah, yeah, it's okay. And, no, no, I will tell you what rape is. And uh, so they said, what is it? And he said, it's to make a woman naked and to set her on fire. Uh, Ashish Khaitan, uh, with the Helka, had, had, had taken a number of uh, tapes pretending to be uh, a sympathizer. He talked with people. Out of all those tapes, I think the one that most frightens me is this one of uh, a person called Suresh Teacher, uh, a general activist, who's sitting with his wife next to him. And in great detail, he's describing how he raped women and smashed them and killed, killed them afterwards. And his wife is smiling and nodding, very very uh, appreciated. Uh, that represents the frontiers of violence. Uh, the fact that uh, the sexual violence moves up another, you know, count conflict areas. Manorma uh, in, 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 in Manipur, where the, the women finally were so devastated that they went in front of the army headquarters and or took off their clothes and said, rape us, uh, to express their anguish. Uh, you know, a few months ago, in fact, after this incident, uh, we got a, I got a request to come to visit a village called Kunan Kushpara in, 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 
Vishnu. The army officers at the height of the Lindsay had had circled and they they take the men out and uh, they had uh, gang raped in house after house in front of the children. Uh, something that will have to hundred women. Uh, I can say not alleged because now it's you know it's been well established through a series of inquiries. But this happened in nineteen ninety four to two thousand five nobody even listened to them. When the militancy reduced they went to the State Human Rights Commission, they in 2010, they finally reached the High Court, and some kind of investigations happened now. They, they, just, they wanted us to listen. And one thing they kept saying, Dilli me ek ladki ka balad ka hua, pura desh shama dilane nikli. Amane ha, so ortho ka balad ka hua hai, nobody cares. So I think that, that I, I, I recognize the limits both the, our capacity for empathy, but also the limits. We cannot, we lose our imagination of another person's suffering, and we don't look at that person as somebody like us. So Suresh Richard's wife does not look at her as a woman because she's Muslim. And so she has no empathy uh, with her. I wrote about this, but I wrote something which, which caused a lot of anger among many people who read it. I said, I talked about these limits uh, to our empathy, but I said, can we also have empathy? Can we also have empathy with those who committed the rape? Empathy, not understanding, not justification. Empathy. I said, let's, let's look at the youngest boy, 17 years, whom uh, India Today carried a story, India's most hated. Uh, reportedly, uh, the one who was the most cruel uh, in, in that act of faith. He came to Delhi at the age of 13. Uh, I worked with homeless street kids. I could, you know, without reading his story or, or learning about it, I could guess the same story of an alcoholic, violent father, extreme deprivation, suffering, abuse, finally finding his way to the streets of Delhi. I have seen that if we, if we reached out to these kids, even the kids who have seen and lived only with violence in their homes and on the streets, that you can heal with love. Uh, nobody reached out to him. What I wrote was that neither I reached out to him, nor did the state, nor did you. So if he became the monster that he became, can we at least recognize our own culpability in that act of, of, of brutality in the bus that night? The other men, you know, and, and, and the sad thing is both this and the Bombay uh, violence also fed into another kind of stereotype because the rapists were also just the way people, you know, these people living in Islam, on the streets, Biharis, uh, you know, you know, all the, the, the very, all the, you know, working class, uh, uh, Lumpen fellows, we knew we were unsafe uh, with them. And this, is, this just proves it. So there was a, a certain class bias in our age as well. Uh, and those, those, those men are growing up in a highly sexualized, hyper-sexualized, hyper-consumerist world from which they will be forever barred. And we don't care. Uh, I sometimes think that if I, you know, suppose I was reborn a hundred years from now and I was writing about India today, particularly about the middle class, how would I, what would I write? How would I describe them? I would, I think I would write about two things as a historian of today. The first is what characterizes the Indian middle class most is inequality with indifference. Is the exile of the poor from our conscience and consciousness. Uh, and the second, and I'll talk about both uh, in the course of 
of, 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 of my words with you. The second is, is what I would call the delegitimization of prejudice. As the two defining features of, of India's middle class. But let me focus first on what I mean by the exile of the poor from our conscience and consciousness. I grew up, uh, I was born in 1955, I grew up as a child, uh, you know, I studied in a pretty elite boys' school, uh, etc. But I, I recall that there was a certain there was a certain ethos in which we grew up. Our mothers would say, don't waste food, there are hungry children outside. Uh, I got my first new set of clothes when I was eight years old. I still remember it was such a good day in my life. I used to always get hand-me-downs. There was a certain way of engaging with uh, your privilege and, 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 and the denial of privilege to put around. You know, I was seeing this somewhere, and as you feel his wife, you know, she came up to me and, and, and uh, said something very... Uh, she said, you know, it's so true. She said, I was born in a rich house, rich home. And my parents used to send me to school in a car. And I used to feel so embarrassed that I used to stop the car a block away. And then I used to walk pretending I was walking to school like the other children. And today, a child would want to place the most, you know, show off the most flashy car, uh, 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 rather than be shy about the fact that I have wealth and other kids don't. Uh, and so we can have, uh, you know, India's richest man building a 27-story house for uh, four people uh, in a city where uh, two black people sleep on the streets. And we say, wow, how glamorous. Uh, you know, nobody, nobody regards it as vulgar. Uh, uh, nobody regards it as something that we, we, we would not endorse. Uh, where is this, you know, uh, Chomsky, uh, you know, Chomsky said, uh, you know, he was talking about his visit to India, and he was saying that nowhere in the world is poverty so dramatically visible as in India. But he said, nowhere else have I seen people so able to see and not see. Uh, you know, to see and look away. And I, I find that really true. I mean, just our sheer absence of outrage, you know, you cannot return, none of us, when we're going home from this talk, uh, on colder nights, uh, you see, we cannot but see children uh, sleeping under the freezing sky. We, 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 you know, when I put my daughter to bed on a cold winter night after she's had, had a full meal and, and, you know, video games and she's sort of protected and we love her, and, it doesn't worry us for even a, a fraction of a second that, that there's just a, another little girl probably one kilometer away sleeping under the open sky who, who, who will have found her food in the rubbish heap, uh, who will, uh, you, know, you know, the kids have told me, you, you'll notice that small kids, both boys and girls, very often don't cover themselves with the sheet. So, so why? So they said that if you cover yourself, it's like an invitation to be raped. So you try to sleep without a cover uh, for some kind of protection uh, and so on. And, and then she'll get up at 4 or 5 in the morning, she'll pick rags, uh, she'll never see the inside of a school. The fact that it doesn't worry us worries me most deeply. Uh, you know, in, in, I've been in policy spaces, you know, I kind of convince, you know, somebody like you know, Prime Minister's office, etc. And if you start talking about what are we doing for homeless children? They say, my God, you know, uh, which, uh, you know, which you know, time work is this man doing? You know, the important things that this country has to do, you know, we have to get investment, we have to grow, we have to have power. I mean, you're really thinking that we should be devoting time worrying about homeless children? And my question, my answer is that what could be more important to start worrying about? The one kilometer that separates my daughter and that, 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 that girl is probably the longest distance in the world. Uh, my daughter will never walk that distance, that girl will never walk this distance. That should worry us. There's, you know, Akhil Gupta, 
he's a scholar, he, he's asked again a, a very interesting question about how many people die in India from completely preventable causes. And he, he has an interesting methodology. He basically looks at the, uh, the human development indicators in Kerala and says that suppose the whole country had the same development indicators, what would be, you know, how many people would still not, you know, uh, basically hunger, uh, malnutrition, uh, uh, healthcare, uh, lack of healthcare kinds of deaths. He calculates very conservatively that 2 million people die every year much larger than any tsunami or uh, all natural disasters and, uh, together. But, but we don't care. And then, that worries me. Uh, is, you know, it's like, uh, uh, it's like, you know, we've normalized poverty so much, you know, like we have the hills and, 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 and the rivers and forests and, and deserts and we have poor people. They've always been there, they'll be there now. Uh, they'll be there in the future. Mr. Monte Kaluvalia and Finance Minister Sadamran were both asked on different occasions, when will poverty, how long will poverty continue in India? And they both separately said 2040. With no problematization. I mean, 2040, which means we're not even promising almost every living person, living poor person today that, you know, uh, in their lifetime they're going to see their life change, and that's all right. That worries me. Uh, <clears throat> I wonder where our, our growing capacity to see and not see comes from. I sometimes think that, that there are three normative frameworks that justify inequality, three great normative frameworks that justify inequality. One is the Indian caste system. And, and our current middle class actually converges all three. So we, we, we have the values of the Indian caste system that it is alright for your birth to determine your life chances. We have the British class system with all its ideas of establishments and you know, good wealth and all of that. Good family, bad family and all that. And then we have you know, the Margaret Thatcher, uh, you know, neoliberal idea that greed is good. Let's give up, uh, you know, socialist guilt of the past. What's wrong with making money and, and, and spending it? Uh, when the food bill, when the food bill was introduced uh, uh, in Parliament, I found myself uh, virtually every night for almost a week trying to go and defend uh, the bill because I could we could find hardly anyone in the ruling establishment uh, who could defend it with any conviction. They actually didn't believe in it. And, you know, the kind of rage that, that, that there was, uh, including the anchors, almost without exception, uh, stunned me. Uh, you know, there was, there was one particular uh, debate, Kevin Mazumdan Shaw, who was actually a pretty enlightened uh, big industrialist. Uh, he, uh, he, one debate turned out to me and said, uh, the rich make their money because they work hard, they have done nothing to harm the economy, why should we be taxed to feed the poor? And I said, I'm sorry, but you'd agree that the poor work hard, probably much harder. Uh, they've done even less to harm the economy. And in a good society, people of wealth and means are happy to share some of it for the poor. But that was not the only kind of discourse. There was another saying, Gushan Das said, distributing food to the poor is going to disincentivize work. In some ways, that, that that enraged me. Because what you're really saying is that poor people are a certain species uh, who, who are very different from us. I mean, you, you, you just have a few more rotis or rice in your stomach and, and you stop working because you have no dreams for your children, for yourself, you don't want a better life. Uh, you know, that's what you're saying. Uh, and then there were, so there were more rational arguments about corruption and the distribution system. And to that, my, my question was only that I, absolutely, I think it's you are right that corruption is a problem, etc. But, uh, and, 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 but why do we use corruption as a veto to programs for the poor alone? Why don't we say we've had spectacular corruption in defense fields, monetarium on all, on all defense fields till we sort this out? Or even more recently, 
the Colgate scandal. Let's have a moratorium on building further power plants, mining more coal till we de develop a, a moratorium. We don't say that. Of course we don't say that. There are too many, it's too important to, to get those things done even despite the corruption. So why is it not important to keep the poor, provide them poor, to provide them education or health care? Why does corruption become only our concern uh, when programs for the poor are, are, are discussed? Another example uh, is, is the debate around uh, the 25% reservation on, on, on the right to education. It was, it, it was again a very interesting uh, debate because you know, there's a lot else that the RT said, but it also said that in, in class one, of every uh, elite school, uh, we will also allow 25% children from disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, the private schools, including those who regard, we regard as very idealistic, Rishi Valley and many others, all pooled a lot of money, employed a battery of the country's most expensive lawyers to resist this provision. And I I looked carefully at, at the petitions and their arguments. It was really interesting because it, it was very close to the kinds of arguments that were made uh, during the desegregation of schools in, in the US uh, uh, at the, in, in the civil rights uh, movement. Almost identical arguments, very really interesting. Uh, the first set of arguments was, we actually are, are very compassionate about that poor child, but that poor child will never be able to uh, you know, manage and, you know, he or she will feel, uh, sort of, uh, so for his sake, let's go out into the slums and, you know, go out into the villages. We'll, we'll set up schools there, but don't, don't let them come and study with our children. Uh, Delhi's, uh, you know, Delhi had this order a little earlier, so what have all the elite schools done? They, they said, okay, we'll do it. So after our kids have safely left the school, in the afternoon, they now open classes, which they technically call part of the same school, but they're completely of a very different standard. Our real fear is, you know, you know can, can, can my child and my domestic helps child and a street child actually sit in the same bench? And they might even become friends. And who knows my domestic helps child might actually do better than mine. I think that's, that's really the problem. Uh, my, my daughter studied in a school called Shigam and her principal actually to the eternal shame of that school uh, was, is actually quoted I think in the Washington Post or one of the American newspapers where she actually said, she probably said it informally and it was quoted but she said, the woman who's mopping my floor, if she sits across the table from me uh, as a parent I can't handle it. That is the reason of our opposition. Anyway. So the second kind of argument that they gave was that uh, merit will be diluted by bringing in poor children. Which means that we are born with the merit and poor people don't have it. Uh, fortunately, I, mean, I can understand this and combat it theoretically, but I, because of the work that I have more recently done with homeless kids, uh, you know, I have many so sort of more better known small accomplishments in my life, but the one that I feel most proud of, proud of is that there are 300 kids here who call me Papa. And I watch them, you know, track picking children, children who live on the streets with love, with healing, you know, and they're now in regular schools. You watch them transform, you watch their possibilities. I hope I live long enough to see some of them grow up and, and uh, you know, contribute, you recognize what equality of opportunity would really do in our country. I teach a course, it's, I, I, my first lecture I always say, I really, you know, I want you to remember one thing, you're not in this room, nor am I in this room because we are the best. Yeah. If a billion people in this country had exactly the same life chances that you and I had, I'm sure I wouldn't be in this room, which I can repeat today. And you all would have to decide whether you would be in this room. So please at least recognize that we are not here because of our merit, but because of our privilege. 
And that at least, let us have the humility to recognize that. When you say that bringing poor children into our schools is going to destroy the merit of these schools, that's, that's completely unacceptable. And the third is, of course, the argument that, and these are all reflected in the US arguments as well. The third, uh, at the segregation, uh, the third was the argument that it is the business of business to business, and why should, you know, why should we be responsible and, and, and so on, and uh, as if there's no difference between selling soap and selling education. Um, uh, just one more word, uh, Sonia Singh, who uh, many of us are familiar with, uh, on ATTV, she wrote a probably the loveliest piece I've seen on this, during this debate. She said, I'm writing not as a journalist or as any kind of expert, but as the mother of a five-year-old child, uh, who is the first class which had children from disadvantaged backgrounds. And she said, I, I'm just seeing what I've watched. And she said, you know, the first uh, parent-teacher meeting that she'd gone to, she looked down and could easily recognize which were the parents of, of children with disadvantaged she went up to one of them and, and they said, okay, is everything okay? So he said, ah, sir, everything is okay, but so far, but, but there's one problem. So she said, what? So he said, uh, there's a birthday party. So why is it a problem? He said that, you know, my kid has been invited, he's so excited. What's the problem? Who will accompany this child? So he said that two kind, you know, when a child, these children are too small, so an adult accompanies them. The two kinds of adults who accompany them, the parents, and they're seated in one place, and they're treated in a certain kind of way. And then there are the IRs and the driver, the domestic head, who are seated in another place. When my child goes with his mother, we are really worried where, where she will be seated. And if she is seated with the IRs, as she's most likely to be, what will, what will my, my son feel? And so, so, we, so we're trying to figure out, we think we shouldn't send him, but he's so excited and we don't know what to do. I love that story because it's only by, by desegregating our schools, our, our offices, our public spaces, we'll figure it out. We we'll figure it out, but not with the kinds of, of you know, the India that, that it, the middle class is constructed. Uh, Anandi Roy wrote very evocatively. He said that the only successful secession, secession movement in this country is the secession of the middle class. We've seceded from the rest of India. We have our own heated colleges, our own air conditioned. Uh, you, know, you, 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 you go through life without having, except your domestic help, you don't encounter poor people. You can actually go through life uh, completely cut off. Uh, you know, you have your, your, your expensive hospitals with, you know, turbine guys outside. You, 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 we, we've seceded. Uh, and unless we, we create new spaces where rich and poor people people of diversity are able to meet again, uh, how will they figure things out? How will we build empathy? Um, talking of domestic help, I was reading a book called The Help. Uh, it's a novel set in the 1960s, again in the US. I read it, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, I read it uh, wincing right through, because the story as many of you would know, is the story of uh, how domestic help was treated in, in, in the south of the US in the 1960s. And a small rebellion that, that they did by simply writing their stories secretly. Uh, that's basically the story. And I winced because I said the way, you know, what they were angry about, about their humiliation. The way they were being treated in the 1960s in the US Middle class India treats its domestic help much worse today. I mean, the whole uh, the whole battle started about uh, uh, because they actually said there'll be a separate toilet uh, for the domestic help. The next battle was that they don't allow, they don't sit with us when we sit on the dining table. We sit separately. In how many of our homes in middle class India do you still have 
the domestic hen actually eating with you, or even eating after you, uh, where you eat. Uh, and we take this for granted. I often think, you know, you, you'll see a small four-year-old boy, and people will say, they just are a baro, they touch the feet of all, all the elders. How does he know at the age of four that all the elders does not include the domestic hen? How does he know that this is one older person I can speak to rudely, I can command, and it's okay? Where do we learn inequality? Where do we learn that inequality is okay? We learn it in our own homes. Um, there are many other examples, but both my parents have been very, very unwell the last three or four years, um, been running from hospital to hospital, got nursing care at home. Uh, one thing that, that I think about a lot, that if I was born somewhere else, my parents were somewhere else, they wouldn't be alive. They would have died a long time ago. Is that, is that appropriate? Is that right in the world that we live in? Um, the other feature of our times that I, that I said uh, I would write about uh, you know, writing this history of India a hundred years from now. Uh, the other thing that I said around, along with the exile of the poor from our conscience and our consciousness, uh, I would talk about the delegitimization of prejudice. And let me explain a little bit by, by, about what I mean. Uh, when you travel around the world, you see that a great, a great number of things have got to globalize the, the denim jeans we wear, the hamburgers we eat, and so on. Another thing that has got globalized, I find, is middle class drawing room conversations about Muslims. Whether I'm sitting in Ahmedabad or in New Delhi or Copenhagen or London or New York, firstly the conversation does turn somewhere or the other, if there's no Muslim in the room, to Muslims. And you hear exactly the same things. As if this is a community which has some kind of monopoly over the history of violence, uh, current rationalization of violence, that they're repressive, they treat women badly and the rest of us don't, uh, that, uh, that they treat large numbers, and so on and so forth. And it's, it is something that is done so uncritically. And I tend to move around relatively, you know, more liberal people uh, just by self-selection. And this is the conversations I hear. I could talk a lot about prejudice, but I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd talk about two or three things that have happened recently in Muzaffar Naga. How hate, how hate is, is, how irrational is the hate that is manufactured, and how, how willingly we plug into that discourse of hate, because we choose to. See, uh, in, the Jats and the, uh, and the uh, Muslims have lived together peacefully in, uh, in that whole Western UP area. They, they keep telling us, we've never fought in history. We didn't fight in 1947. Everyone was, everything was burning around us in UP, but we didn't fight then. We didn't fight when the Bapi Masjid fell. We never fought. <coughs> Mr. Narendra Modi's closest left one goes to this area and two months later we have an enormous violent clash uh, in which 50,000 people leave their homes and live in camps of which 20,000 are still there. I was part of fact finding committee, I went there once, I went there again. And we learn what happened. See, uh, people who want to uh, you know, I, a riot requires the manufacture of hatred first. It also requires a complicit state, uh, but uh, which they got. But, but how was hatred manufactured between two communities which have never fought? The largely landlords are the, are the jobs, the, the 
we found workers other Muslims, we live in the same villages, they want to live together. You won't make them fight. So they're very care they're very selective about choosing uh, an issue which will which will resonate best with our prejudices, with our potential prejudices. What was the issue they chose? In, among the Jats, being very conservative with a certain highly patriarchal attitude to, uh, uh, to women and the whole notion of honor killing, etc., what they said was that, you know, the Muslims are, have a new project. And the project is love jihad. Uh, what does love jihad mean? <coughs> love jihad means that, I mean, this is serious. This is serious stuff. I'm not sort of not joking. That there's a whole project that Muslim boys are given, you know, deodorants, you know, the kind you see on television where the girls keep uh, sort of run after you. Uh, they're given, uh, you know, fancy gadgets, mobiles, uh, good clothes to wear. With the single project that they must attract Hindu girls. Hindu girls have nothing in their head, no agency. Uh, they'll just sort of get attracted by uh, these uh, Muslim boys. And the purpose is to make them. Uh, fall in love, get married, get converted into Islam, to be Islam, the Muslim people. Now that's, firstly, your willingness to plug into that prejudice. Then a, a story happens, uh, you know, on August 27th, I think, uh, there was a motorcycle accident between a Jat boy uh, called Sachin and a Muslim boy called Shahnawaz. They, they meet, uh, they, they fight, uh, a clash, you know, this road rage kind of battle ensues. Sachin's cousin Gaurav also comes in. At the end of it, all three are dead. What the people then propagate, uh, Mr. they say that actually what was happening was that Sachin, uh, that Shanavaz was talking uh, Sachin's sister, who later came on television and said, I don't know that this guy is had nothing to do with it. So he was talking, the story was that he was talking to his sister. So as an honor killing, the two brothers killed uh, uh, him, justifiably. And then uh, a BJP MLA called Sankit Son uh, on his Facebook, and luckily because of Facebook, you can, uh, internet, you can actually track, he takes a video which was made in, which is a video of in Pakistan in CR code two years earlier, where two brothers were savagely attacked by a mob and killed very brutally. From their clothes, they looked Muslim. So he said, these two brothers are actually such an order, and this is the mob in Muzaffarnagar, which, which killed them after they had done this justified order killing. Uh, because of pornography, uh, apparently you now in rural India, you, you know, you, these, these videos can be passed from phone to phone. 27th August, 6th September, they have this Mahapanchayat called Beti Bachar Bahu Bachar, saying that this large jihad is happening and in this scale, this is what will happen. So much rage, next day they set out and start attacking the Muslims. Now, and this has gone on, and now the, all of this is proved, but the hatred doesn't go. They're not allowing people to come back. I, when we went on our revisit, the second prejudice, is, I went on our, we went on our revisit and we found that they had forcefully closed the camps or the people are just unwilling to go. So they are in an even more desperate situation. Ask people, why are we closing the camps forcefully? He said, these are Muslims, they, uh, the Muslims, they love eating free food. That is why if we keep giving free food, they will sit in the camp. So we have to stop it so that we force them to go. Now again, this is a species, and if, I, I really would, would wish that they would spend two days living in a camp and, and, and see what it entails with your family. Would anyone choose to live in that situation? Uh, I recall actually in one of the, I was a district collector during the Bajana sit time, we had a riot, and, and one, uh, I, I was of course very, very anguished at, at you know, people's houses being burned and all of this. So I remember I was sitting and, and one Vishwani Parishad guy with a big tikka walked into my office and he said, Pritsam, why are you feeling so uh, so sad? 
you know these Muslims, they actually set their fire, set their houses on fire only so that they could get compensation. You know the amount of compensation we were giving at that time for a burnt house was 2,000 rupees. I couldn't stop myself. I got up, I caught hold of the man's hand. I said, now you said this, please let's go to your house. Please set it on fire in my presence. I will you know, give you 2,000 rupees, a check from my own personal bank account. Immediately. So he was startled and so I said, no, now you have to go now and, and insist you go and burn your house. But the, the sheer irrationality, I just wanted to give these two examples of our prejudices. That we just don't interrogate and we, and we hold on to also defines the middle class in India and indeed in much of the world. Uh, what has this done to, to the idea, you know, I, I think it's altered the idea of a good society from what I understand. A good society is one which promotes ideas of justice and, and caring and solidarity. But also the idea of a good state. And debates such as the kind that we had on the food bill, which have revived actually with these new election results, it's open season for attacking uh, uh, people like us, Sir Pawar talked about the Jhola Wadas, I don't carry a Jhola, but uh, who uh, wrongly advised the government to sort of distribute freebies to the poor and, and all of this. And uh, he also said Indra Gandhi was, because she was a strong leader, she never need, she never relied on Jhola Wadas uh, and, and so on. But it, it really is a revival once again of, of an open season of attacking people who feel that there's a duty of the state for social protection. Uh, and again, quoting Chomsky, I, I like very much what he said somewhere. He said the idea of social protection is basically the idea that we should take care of each other. You know better, uh, that's all we are saying. That in a country which has 80 million tons of grain, we don't know what to do with it. Uh, jean uh, was explaining, you know, just to illustrate what 80 million tons of grain means, he said, if you put it one bag at it alongside, you put it in a line, you can go to the moon, you can come back, you can go around the world. We have that much grain, every second child is malnourished, 230 million people sleep hungry. It doesn't seem to make sense. Uh, if you have an economics, uh, you know, that, it, that, that feels this, this makes sense, I don't subscribe uh, to that economics. I mean, I was growing up uh, in college, uh, Schumacher had written a book called Small is Beautiful with a lovely subtitle, Economics as if People Matter. Uh, and, and so we're talking about solidarity, about empathy, about taking care, and a just and caring state. Uh, and the idea of a just and caring state, I believe, more and more can only be located in a just and caring society. So I mean, I have spent too much of my life making demands from the state. Uh, I believe we need to start making demands from ourselves, much more profoundly. Uh, and if we change, uh, can we expect, uh, if we cultivate, we deepen, we reclaim our capacity for empathy. And for reason, I can spread this. Uh, Possibly, uh, we can much more authentically hope for and expect uh, a just and caring state. Otherwise, we just get the states that we deserve. Uh, you know, the you know, you know the secular parties like Samajwadi, etc. I mean, the sheer cynicism with which they uh, that they allowed this riot to happen in the hope that it would lead to some polarization of 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 of. Uh, votes on identity grounds. And then they claim to be a secular party. The Congress, uh, completely invisible in the same as Dr. Nagar. And we ask them in camp after camp, has anyone from the Congress come here and tried to uh, take care of this if we haven't seen a single person? Um, I, 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 I see, uh, you know, my, <laughs> I, I, I just close. Uh, I feel that you know, and it's, it's unfashionable to say so, I do believe that we have to reclaim also the idea of empathy, love, recognize that love potentially can be an act of resistance, it can be an act of solidarity, uh, it can be extremely revolutionary. And I'll give you one example. 
we are dealt with anger. Uh, in, in this city itself, in the, in the Kishti, uh, had actually first thought of the idea of the langar. Guru Nanak picked it up. The langar is not just a food charity. It is only, you know, that's one of its smaller elements. It's also one of everybody contributing what they can quietly, anonymously. But much more important, it is how you treat the person of whom you are feeling. You must treat them as a guest. You must treat them with respect. You must sit with them. Uh, you know, the story is told of Akbar. Uh, coming to meet one of the gurus and he was seated and there was a beggar who was seated next to him and he knew Akbar being Akbar was happy uh, for that to happen. Uh, uh, the, the, and in, in the 13th and the 15th, 16th centuries, these were particularly radical ideas. Radical ideas centered so centrally around the, the idea of love. Uh, and I do believe that we need to think a little more about how we can Reclaim love as a foundation of our search for a better society. And incidentally, we, we did a small study uh, survey with the homeless about what is happening for food charities in, in Delhi today. Found something very interesting. When I wrote about it, everybody was uniformly angry. Because we found not a single Christian food charity in Delhi. And I was studying a Christian school, I was sure. The yeah, Archbishop has also discussed with me, nobody denies it, but they still haven't started one. There was not, uh, we couldn't find, uh, the Hindu food charities were very interesting. They said that the trouble with the Hindu food charities is that you give what you want to give when you want to give, not what we need when we need it. So you have your holy day on Saturday or, or Tuesday and you give us uh, sweet laddus, but we need wholesome food on a regular basis. We don't care what we need. That's not why you're giving it. And I thought that was quite profound. And we found that the Gurdwaras, Siskanj, uh, Pagna Sahib, are, are, are stopping people who look uh, destitute. When I wrote this, uh, the Muslims, they were saying, also the mosque used to be a place, a lot of that hasn't. The only good practice we really found was around Jama Masjid. And you can buy tokens of 20 rupees, 30 rupees. Uh, and which you give to a destitute person and who can reclaim it by sitting in a, a dhaba when they need it. And I thought it was a beautiful system, it was respectful, it was, uh, but that was the only one that we found. Anyway, because I wrote this and I happened to be born in a Sikh family, um, my mother's brothers are in some of the Gurdwara communities, they were extremely upset about this, their nephew had shamed and so on in their meeting. And uh, then they called me to try to explain. And it was really an interesting conversation. They said, you don't understand. You know these poor people, they dirty, they smoke, they drink, they take drugs. They'll come into the temple, they'll, they'll destroy the purity of the temple. I said, I have only one, one question for you. In the Guru's time, when Guru Nanak was alive, were poor people different? And if at that time he didn't feel that the dirty, uh, drinking, smoking, uh, allegedly, poor person did not destroy the purity, but was, was somebody who should be welcomed as a, as a revered guest. What has changed in democratic India today? I think something very profound has happened to the way we look at, at the poor around us. That worries me. Uh, finally, uh, my last point is that. Uh, where do I derive proof? John Steinbeck said this a long time ago. He said, if you are in need, uh, if you are hurt, if you are hungry, go and find some poor people. They are the only ones who help you. The only ones. I, you know, working with the homeless, again, in Jama Masjid, on cold winter night, you actually have people who hire out blankets, 30 rupees. And it's a huge amount of money for somebody who's homeless. And we see a lot of people making a choice between the evening meal and actually having something to cover themselves. But one day when I was out, I noticed something very interesting. I found that, that, that these really old, mentally ill, old, frail, disabled, homeless people all, all had blankets. So I said, how did that happen? And uh, they said, 
You would be more that these people would die through the night. You would. So when we gather in the evenings, all the able bodied people first pool money uh, and they hire blankets for the for the injured and the disabled. And if there's money left, then we think about ourselves. And they said it very matter of fact, of course that's what we do. And I th thought that you know, what the state should be doing is not doing, what the NGO should be doing and not doing, what the entrepreneurs should be doing and not doing, our most destitute people are doing. Uh, uh, in, in Gujarat, for many years, I was devastated by what I saw in terms of brutality. My wife told me that I would get up in the middle of the night, you know, uh, uh, with the nightmares and so on. Uh, but what healed me was that I slowly learned with the time that I spent that for every story of, of brutality, there were at least three stories of kindness, of people who saved lives, uh, who, uh, in extraordinary circumstances. And that's also the story of Gujarat. And that's actually the bigger story of Gujarat. Uh, to me, uh, and uh, just you know, one of the places uh, there was a place. Uh, there's you know, somebody told me out of hundreds of stories, uh, uh, a village just outside uh, Ahmedabad, where they said that 110 Muslims had been taken care of by this farmer. So I, I for 10 days. So I thought you know, it must be a really rich landlord. So I went to see him. I found a very small, modest farmer with a piece of land. And uh, he was very embarrassed that I came to see him. And the Muslims said the story was really that they, it was a cold night, uh, they, they, they ran away, the houses were burned, 110 of them hid up in the, in the fields. Night fell, they didn't know what to do, uh, they didn't know how they, the children were desperate. So they said, they knew he was a compassionate man, so they went to knock on his door saying, just let us stay one night. And he and his wife said, why one night you will stay here as long as you need? When he assembles his entire joint family, uh, they have a stock of grain this large for the, for the year, uh, which they opened up. And uh, his entire, all the women were cooking food for 110 people. The men were standing guard 10 days, 10 nights, protecting them. Uh, people came and taunted them, they set fire to their field, they set fire to a part of their house, but they didn't. And uh, even after 10 days, he, the Muslims said that he, they insisted that hum kaptak rahenge and, you know, and, and he, he stayed there. So when I asked him, I said that, what, what is it that, why did you do this? So he, he was, and he said, how could I bear it that people of my village were treated this way? When he added, this village belongs to Muslims as much as it belongs to me. And that was a time when I longed to hear that from my colleagues. This country belongs to Muslims as much as it belongs to me. With the same conviction. I then asked, you must have been frightened. And his wife at that point got really irritated with me. She said, when you are doing the right thing, what scope is there to feel frightened? Very simply. Uh, and then finally I said, you, you must at least have one big regret. You know, your entire stock of being for the year disappeared uh, in, uh, you know, in 10 days. So he said, no. God, Thakurji, he had a little temple to Thakurji. He said, Thakurji in short, that my, my, my stock of grain has never been increased since then. And I thought to myself that here's this man who, who has no confusion that his Thakurji will reward him for saving the 110 Muslims. I don't know where our confusion is with all our education and all our rationality comes. The last story I'll tell, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm taking this time, but the riot victims in Gujarat. Uh, in Johapara, where, where many of them would not have been able to return home, my colleagues were sitting with this lady, and she was this small tenement, etc. And a, a fakir came, a, a Muslim beggar, and she gave him five rupees. The Muslim beggar went, and she started weeping. And she was weeping piteously, so my colleagues were really worried, what have we said that has, we must have said something that hurt her. And then she explained, she said, you know, if, uh, you know, before the riots happened, if he had come to me, I would have given him at least 50 rupees. I would have sat him down and I would have given him food. Look at what I'm reduced to. I could give him only 5 rupees. And I thought that she understood something that we have so completely forgotten. Her greatest sense of loss was not that she was living in a one-room, uh, you know, relief camp 
some way. The greatest sense of loss was that she lost her capacity to give as much as she could or wanted to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was moving. The one level from this point to keep silent. But the chairman has to do his duty. So I begin to think the first thing. I think what fascinated me about Harsh is the way he, he's a storyteller. In fact, I'm glad we got a social scientist in the full sense of the term, because social scientists are poor storytellers. But by capturing the right kind of anecdote, I think he told interesting stories. And I think Joseph Nixon is like he was well in different parts. But hate and compassion really in different ways. One was the story of how middle class looks at poverty, and the other was the question of how in the Muslim people learn to be each other. Two different stories, overlapping in a different way, talking about two kinds of violence. One haunted by the development project called poverty, one haunted by the riots, especially what happened in Bhutan. I think it's a powerful framework. I wish Monte Kaluvalia and a few others were present here. Because to a certain extent it captures what has to be done. So the act of storytelling is actually a theory of doing. And I found that fascinating. I think the stories are too moving for me to challenge. But it's precisely the story that makes me want to challenge it. But I think both of us began as very secular people. Yeah, I think what I found interesting about your story is the fact that a secular man eventually appeals to religion to redeem society. The hunger. I think in a deep and fundamental way is a great religious creation. And to a certain extent, the idea of seva, and to a certain extent, you're going to civilizational categories. <coughs> because the standard political categories don't help you. And I think, in a way, we are trying to confront the fact that standard economics, standard theories of poverty, or middle class notions of caring are not enough. Something more is required. And in that way, it's not just a story of a profound set of stories, it's an attempt to create a profound response that India has a civilization. Because this is not stories about charity, aid, or development. These are stories about people who care and talk of the language of caring in a different degree. Religion becomes important. Though religiosity can be important. And I think in this sense, Harshad made a move from his earlier secular stories. And I think to me, that is a profound move. Uh, I won't take more time on this. There are lots of questions, quarrels, maybe even ways of agreeing or telling a story. In the so I open up to the audience. I believe there's a similar rule at IIC. It's 8 o'clock, is it? Okay, so we can violate it by 10 minutes. Okay, 8 10. Okay, so, okay, perfect. Uh -huh. You mentioned that. May I have a name? Just
you know, and the planes that were used were unforgiving planes because they required intensive training. I mean, this extent. And one other thing I have to say about the majority of children, we have this concept of jitha, which means we cannot share with you. And I think this is a symptom of this lack of sharing and empathy. Thank you. Let's ritualize it, maybe two or three questions at a time, Harsh. Okay. Hindi can go ahead. मेरा नाम एकदम देशोदा में अरिंगाबाद में रहता हूँ और अर्श भाई से काफी प्रेरणा ली है और बहुत कुछ उनका पढ़ा आज बात ये है कि हम गरीब के बारे में बहुत बोलते हैं लेकिन गरीब के जीवन को और गरीब आदमी है पूर नंबर नहीं है पूर इंसान है और एक जीवित जिंदा आदमी और उस तरह से ये सारी पावर्टी की सारे तरी मैं भी व्यवसाय से अर्थशास्त्र की हूँ बड़ा अनर्थ का शास्त्र है वो और बर्बादी का है लेकिन हर की बात ये है कि कि वेदना और संवेदना हमारी सारी शिक्षा में कहीं खोखला बन नहीं लगता है कि हमारी सारी शिक्षा में हमें ये संवेदना आई नहीं और हमारे जो जीवन के मूल्य हैं और टेंथ ऑफ थियरी की बात और आउंस ऑफ प्रैक्टिस यही तो आप मिसाल आपने दिया कि सारी थियरी आखिर वो जो कबीर कहते हैं कि तू कहता है कागज की लिखी मैं कहता हूँ आखन भी ये जो सत्य को आप आपने जो देखा और सत्य को देखने का झांकने का हम देखकर जो अनदेखी करते हैं आ, उसका मुझे लगता है ये सारा भारत का सारा मध्यम वर्ग और इसकी सारी जो प्रेरणा है वो वो आज के सिवा और कुछ नहीं और जो हमें मिला है वो हमें मिला है हमारे काबिलियत से मिला है हमारे पूर्व जन्म के पुण्य से मिला है हमने कुछ तो किया है इसलिए मिला है ये हमारे यहाँ ये जो जनतंत्र का मूल्य जो होना चाहिए वो नहीं है वो जनतंत्र का मूल्य क्या राजनीति के विकल्प से आएगा या फिर जैसे आप बोल रहे थे कि फिर वो हमें वो मूल्य जो हमारी कहीं हमारी विरासत में है वो धार्म रिलीजियस रिलीजियोसिटी तो गलत है लेकिन हमारी जो मूल्य है हमारी विरासत है उससे आएंगे इसके बारे में अगर कुछ और दोस्ती आप डाल सकते हैं हर्ष तो दूसरा व्याख्यान नहीं लेकिन कुछ ये होगा और दिल हमेशा आप हमेशा वही देखती है जो दिल महसूस करता है हमारा दिल महसूस क्यों नहीं करता हमें हो क्या है practicing agnostic is. So I thought a little more about it. Uh, I derive my agnosticism uh, most of all, uh, most vividly from a Sufi story uh, of Rabia. Uh, this story told about Rabia uh, running uh, madly down the streets with a, a bucket of water in one hand and a mashal, a flaming torch in the other. So they say, why do you have this bucket of water? She said, I want to douse out the flames, uh, uh, I, I want to douse out the flames of hell. So then, why do you have this torch? I want to set fire to heaven. And basically, that we should lead a good life or try to lead a good life, neither because of the, uh, the fear of hell or the uh, reward of, uh, of, of heaven, but because it is a good, it is a good thing to do. I I seek my agnosticism from saying that I don't know what is going to happen afterwards and it doesn't matter. It should not matter. Uh, <coughs> but I've also found that a lot of my friends in the left 
I was so extremely intolerant of faith. And I believe that my understanding of secularism is not a denial of faith, but equal respect for all faiths, including the absence of faith. And I think that the certainty of atheism is also a faith, because no one can know. And it is to me as irrational as faith itself. Uh, and therefore, I think the only rational and humane position is one of saying, you, 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 faith makes sense to you, that's fine. It doesn't make sense to another person, that's fine. Uh, but it's to me largely irrelevant. But if for some people they derive their humanity from faith, that's, that, that's good. But it, particularly interesting to me is, uh, is, is you know, to see the two people who fought most for the secular idea of India, one of them gave his life for it, are Gandhiji and, and Jinnah, deeply religious. And, uh, you know, and uncompromisingly secular. The two people who fought most for the religious state, Jinnah was not a practicing Muslim Right. Uh, was a self-professed atheist. And I find there's a lesson there somewhere. That those who fought for the centrality of religion and politics were irreligious. The person, persons who fought most bravely against it were deeply religious. So where and why should I be suspicious or angry or, or dismissive of another person's faith? About Hinduism, I'm not sure it is Hinduism alone. I think there's a certain cultural space that we collectively share. Uh, let me give you a couple of ideas from Islam. And you know, because of the stand that I took after Gujarat, the uh, uh, Muslim community treats me with much higher regard than I deserve. So when I address gatherings only of Muslims, I say some very hard things. Uh, one of them is that they, they keep asking, uh, you know, especially in the context of Buddha, that we can't understand how could we Dalits and Adivasis have attacked us. We just can't understand. And the tribal, the Dalits and the tribal. My question, my answer to them is that I understand your anguish. But I have a question to you. For generations when the Dalit and Adivasi around you was being so savagely oppressed, when did you ever speak out? And just as an example, I mean, we did a study which showed that in the majority of Gujarat villages, they don't allow that it's still to drink from the village well. I said, please show me one village in all across Gujarat where people said, you know, that the Muslims say, okay, you can't drink in there, but please come to our well. I said, please, I want to take, make a pilgrimage to that village. They haven't been able to find that village yet. Uh, and, and, and so I think the absence of solidarity is, is much more comprehensive. Uh, 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 Ramjarit Manas was written by Tulsi Das. Uh, Tulsi Das in, you know, was, sort of, was attacked a lot by the Brahmins. So there's one of his dohas which is very interesting. He says, he telling the Brahmins, do what you like, I will beg for my food, and I'll sleep in the mosque. Sleep in the mosque. It meant that the mosque was a place where people, destitute homeless people of every faith were welcome. And because he spent a lot of his life in Ayodhya, I like to dream that he might have actually been sleeping in the bathroom of itself. And, 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 and when I go to the same place where I talk about the blanket, Jama Masjid has probably the largest concentration of homeless people, probably in a small space anywhere in the world. There were 10,000 homeless people who counted, you know, just about a couple of square kilometers. On a cold winter night, I cannot help looking up to the Java Masjid and saying, if only they remembered, you know, at least the women and children, could they not take them in on a cold winter night and give them a place to sleep? With the I think that the loss is much more comprehensive and much more profound, uh, Mr. Bhagat. And lastly, about you know the importance of it, and when I, again this course I teach at Jai and Indabad, I say the first thing I say is that you're not here because you're the best. The second is I if there's anything that I want to convey to you is that poor people are people. They have exactly the same feelings. You and I that that, that, that when you see a uh, mentally ill woman on the street who's homeless with matted hair, and kids are throwing stones at her and, and so on. 
please recognize that intrinsically she has the same dignity as her mother. She just happens to have been landed up in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, see them as see them as people. And therefore, at the end of the course, instead of instead of uh, asking them to write an exam, I asked them to find one poor person in Indra and to find out and write about their stories. And I found it really significant that they've done it. Each of them say, you see, just across, I'm, you know, I'm putting them together in a book called uh, Two Sides of a Red Brick Wall, because just on the other side of the gates of Ayanandabad is uh, it, it's a lot of homeless people, really a large number of homeless people. They've walked past them several hundred times, that's where they hang out, that's where all the dhabas are, etc. But you never, never realize that there are people sitting there with stories. You sit with one of them and you suddenly recognize that this person, you know, in that little space, this is their kitchen, this is where, where the child speaks, this is, this is where they come from, this is what they've struggled with, these are their dreams, these are their aspirations, these are their disappointments. You suddenly realize that, hey, you know, you know uh, far from being a non-person or a lesser person, I'm not sure if I was sort of me in that kind of situation, I have retained my humanity, or my spirit, or my compassion, to the degree that it is possible for, for this person to do so. So I think that it's the same idea of empathy, and you know, a lot of my friends in the left from where uh, I, I derive a lot of my other strength, feel very worried, they can't locate the question of compassion. Marx Baba never said something about compassion, I am not sure he did. They, they can't quite locate uh, where this discourse is coming from. I'm not sure they know where to locate it either. But I do believe that any struggle for justice which is divorced from the idea of compassion is less authentic. Just as much as Mother Teresa's work, uh, work for compassion which is not built on an understanding of justice is equally uh, flawed in my mind. If people need to believe and fight for justice in a framework of compassion. There's no point, you might as well close down the faith. I mean, if, 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 if that's where the sick faith is, then why, why, why did you create it in the first place? So we have lost a lot of the values of the world. Sir, firstly, I want to congratulate you for being a proponent of food security bill. As I know, we produce around 17% of the world's grains. And we have a roughly one-sixth of the population of the world that is again some down to less than 17%. So I think if we want to feed everyone in this country, we can feed. So any attempt in this direction is a very welcome attempt. Now my question sir is, I was very moved when you said 300 homeless kids now call you Papa out of respect. But sir, you alone or I alone can't change the entire scenario. What's your idea or what's your, if anything, how to institutionalize this system or how to make this system as a part of framework or the policy framework so that we can implement it on a much broader base. And sir, one more thing, what what is the what are you thinking about removing uh, what's your idea of removing malnutrition among the homeless kids and how are you going to it's a long answer. And let me just answer very, very briefly. Uh, in one of the discussions when I joined the National Advisory Council, the Prime Minister uh, 
spoke to us and he said, I recognize that millions of people are getting their priorities. Uh, so we value what you have to say, but I have three caveats. And the caveats are, don't propose anything that interferes with growth. Don't propose anything that costs a lot of money. Don't propose anything that requires high state capacities. Uh, because the state is incapable of delivering. Uh, so fundamentally, there's a certain premise that, it, that, that, that we've got it all wrong in the past, that the state can never provision for the poor. We need to create an environment in which the private sector can pursue profit, because uh, only that will create jobs and that will create wealth and everyone will be better off. That's a legitimate viewpoint. I mean, I, with all respect, it, there's nothing magnified uh, uh, about that viewpoint. But empirically, we've seen, if you had any doubts, during the, the, the peak areas of growth have been almost of jobless growth in the foreign sector. What has happened is, uh, is private companies have started going more and more into informalization and, uh, and, uh, and contractization. Now, informalization, if you really go to the Juki Gupis of Delhi itself, you find women are, uh, you know, are, are being delegated work by these big companies and they earn, with, you know, the whole family works, child labor has come back to the back door, there's no labor hours, there's no protection, there's no responsibility by these big, big companies. And they earn, uh, and, uh, they earn really paltry amounts of money. Uh, so, so I think that whole notion that markets are going to serve the poor in themselves is flawed. I'm not against growth in markets, I, mean, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, but I do feel, and that's what I try to say there, and I say again, I feel that while, if you believe in markets, let them, let them function. But let us have a consensus, let's have a debate around, in this country, about the floor of human dignity. Let us agree that there's a certain level behind, below which no human being should be allowed to fall. And we can have a debate about what it is. For, for me, no child should sleep hungry, no child should have to sleep under the open sky, no one should die because they can't afford health care. Uh, uh, no old person should have to work till their last dying day only because they don't have some kind of a social security. And there, there, there are half a dozen things that we could debate about. Whatever it costs, the middle class should demand it. Far from resisting it, we should demand it. You should say, I have a stake. I don't want my child to grow up uncaring, uh, in privilege, uh, with hunger and homelessness and, and, and suffering around. Whatever it costs, tax us and, and we, we are willingly willing to share it. Beyond that, let markets function. So what I'm really talking about is nothing more revolutionary than a social protection net. Uh, and you know, I quoted Chomsky earlier where he said that the idea of social protection is basically the idea that we should take care of each other. But he goes on to say something very interesting. He says, but we live in times where this is considered an extremely dangerous and subversive idea, which needs to be crushed at every cost. And in, in that sense, I find it really funny because I, I'm, you know, ideologically I'm pretty, I haven't grown probably from the time I was in college. This is roughly where I was, it is completely extended, but I haven't seen very much ideology. My friends who are far more left, uh, and some of them are senior people in right in politics today uh, in my class, have, have actually moved so far right. So now they look at me and they say, you're a Maoist, uh, you're some sort of really uh, subversive. I say, like, hey, you know, uh, in fact, I'm hugely opposed to Maoist violence. All I'm talking about is really a, a more caring society, a more caring state, built around notions of basic justice. But we're living in times where this is considered an extremely subversive idea. Hello. Of framing 
um, the reason we hold our differences. I, I think, um, personally, it seems in my interaction with my relatives and stuff, um, it seems that there's a kernel of self um, protection, um, also related to empathy in the sense that I know for a fact my cousins and my aunties and um, my grandparents and so on um, care a little bit because you can hear it, but they don't want to let themselves be overwhelmed by a need to care for the magnet. The, the huge, enormous size of the problem, um, and hence keep um, making excuses around why it's either not, not a problem or so on and so forth. Um, I can kind of see by your know, voting, you kind of agree with me, but I'm also um, wondering um, of the different defense mechanisms or ways of stories um, in your approach to several people who have them, have you found any methods are more effective or most effective than actually um, bringing people along to a realization um, to change the way that they view people? I think also, yeah, a lot of people are quite scared that if they change their mind, they have to change their entire life and therefore they want, don't want to change their mind, even though they know that's what they think. Um, yeah, you have to hear your thoughts. It's actually so profound that I can just respond to it immediately if I can. I think it's a, it's a wonderful, very, very perceptive question. Uh, I do believe that one major reason for the, the tall walls that we built around our capacities for empathy is that we feel powerless with the magnitude of, of what we confront. Uh, and, and therefore, perhaps some of this indifference is built around is a rationalization of the defense mechanism. But what, what, what still troubles me is, is, is that it's not, it, uh, there's something called Eddie Wiesel, uh, the Holocaust survivor, who actually said something very really nice. He said that the opposite of love is not hate, the opposite of love is indifference. You know, it's, while, I, while I'm talking about and my, the subject of my talk today was indifference, what worries me is that actually it goes much more than indifference. There's actual hostility. There's anger. There's rage against the world. Uh, there's this feeling that uh, you know, these are the people who are hurting our city, these are the people who are, who are the source of all our crime. Uh, uh, you know, the homeless people, they really say, like I, I remember one night I was traveling and this cop was just thrashing uh, a group of homeless people. I just went up and I said, my son, come on, He said, no, no, I, you know, there's crime in the city has been protected from terrorism. And therefore, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thrashing these people. So I said, in the world, have you ever heard of a homeless person who is a terrorist, a terrorist who is homeless? And where would he hide his RDX? Where would he hide his you know, bombs and, 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 and so on? So if you really randomly have to look for homeless people, go to Oberoi Hotel, you probably have a greater chance of finding someone, etc. But, but, but he, uh, uh, you know, the, again, the irrationality, the kind, and, about begging, you know, we did this, uh, and Slumdog kind of Millionaire wasn't helpful. This whole idea that there's some, you know, that people are begging are part of some gang, which is, uh, you know, I've worked with English kids for so long, I've almost never, I'm not in doubt. Your parents do uh, use their kids for begging. There's nothing really more sinister than that. We need to rationalize. So, uh, so we say, don't, don't give something to a beggar. Should we give it? Should we not give it? Etc. My point, Ashwin, is only that that I think that uh, that it, it's, we've gone beyond different indifference to uh, the state is actually not just neglectful of its poorest citizens; it's almost at war with them. And and that's that's something that is more than a defense mechanism. We are not actually uh, looking at the local uh, situation, which is the subject of your, uh, at the global level, that we have United Nations. We have no number of United Nations. FAO is there, full of nations. And from time to time, they help the whole countries. 
when they are in the fifty But what can be the mechanism at the two hundred fifty thirties we have to think of? And we have different set of parameters, local problems everywhere, which cause the same thing. See, effect is the same, but the reasons are different everywhere. So at the global level, can we have some kind of mechanism? See, um, countries have bilateral relationships and they try to promote bilateral. But we have no, what you call, regulation through the United Nations or any other global agencies, except religion. That is why the religion becomes important from place to place as a parameter of growth as well as security. Uh, and uh, you have to uh, have some kind of uh, longer when you have talked. Is there some anywhere United Nations number except the war fields, except uh, the natural disasters on a regular basis where it can be, how it can be, and how the local governments can go about it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think I would really like to see a day of global solidarity. Let's first try to build national solidarity. That's why we're even a city level solidarity. Uh, and it will slowly build up to a day. I mean, uh, if we are not caring about you know, uh, the, the, the homeless child who's outside our door, if I'm going to tax you to feed somebody in, uh, in, uh, in an unknown country in Africa, uh, uh, I think it's a long, <coughs> one day I hope that will happen. So first let's build our solidarity down upwards. Yeah, sorry, two questions, quickly. I, Three. Have, yeah. I have one statement to make and I'm interested in uh, your response. Going back to your very first point about em empathy, uh, you mentioned that it is characterized by imagining somebody else's pain. Uh, but I also think you uh, missed out on the fact that exercising empathy also uh, involves someone assuming the position of a benefactor when you give money to a beggar, so on and so forth. And for a lot of people, I think, just that in initial moment where you hand over 10 rupees or 20 rupees, whatever it is, they absolve themselves of a very grand social responsibility. It sort of feeds their, uh, feeds their conscience. I mean, uh, for instance, it's, it's a very cheap way to, I think, satisfy oneself. And um, I'm just interested in what, what you have to say to that. Uh, my name is Ezra. Uh, what you're saying here is basically a value defined, like you ask, this is a request that is value defined. You basically, uh, uh, the thing is that with people, it's, it's always different. That's why people follow different religions for whatever their values are. Now, when you're saying that uh, these prejudices will disappear with the change in values, I don't know if that's really possible. Uh, you gave an example of uh, desegregation in schools and things like that, uh, but there's still a lot of racism in terms of uh, more African Americans in prisons and things like that. Um, so, what you're really asking for, uh, for compassion as a definitive value for everyone, it's actually very subversive, I think. <laughs> so, um, you, you require like a, a redefine societal and economic systems. So, um, how do you really think that would happen? I mean, how, how would you get people to change their value systems? Uh, the one man behind to beat you to the drum. <laughs> I have a uh, I have a personal question. From here, I'm struggling. So. Uh, I, I, I work with, so I kind of echo a lot of what you said, and work in an NGO and, and kind of feel attached and kind of see that I can do some sensible work. And I've realized that over the past 10, 20 years, you know, so I, so I work with tribals, work on, on issues of livelihoods, etc. Et and then there is this time when I, after going to the field, I would like to come back to the comfort of my home. 
eat my lunch a little and then have my conversation. Now, and I figured that, at the, you know, at, at the end, I do the more authority to speak to others. Because at some point, I have not been able to break this barrier where I couldn't open up the house to, to people and say, you come in, let's have Raj out here. I always like to go out, meet them at their homes, would like to really empathize with them. I would really like to know how your individual journey has been, where did your doctor study, where do you live, etc. <laughs> Last question, yeah. Sorry, I couldn't see you. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Nidhi Pravan. I study health systems at Charles Hopkins. And uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about the uh, involving cafeteria and also about uh, the problem of malnutrition and chicken. And I, I feel that. I feel that in a while we can't have sort of a descriptive approach to solving the myriad of problems that we have, but at a societal level, uh, we are we are like rightly said, you know, as a as a middle class or as a elite class, it's it's a, uh, it's a it's a pity of a pathetic state that we are very very much devoid of devoid of compassion and we always don't see people that we that are that are around us and then. Uh, we don't even make an effort to do that, and it's too much of a strain uh, on our on our uh, on our on our daily lives. Or you know, we say that oh, you know, why should I why should I you know kind of like stretch me on my nine to five? You know, kind of like spending time with these people. And and it's a question of mindsets and attitudes. Where I think that I I have a similar question as to how do you how do you actually go about you know uh, enacting a change in the value systems? You see it. Uh, Day in day out, you see it within your higher household. You see the discrimination that you know uh, your mother won't offer the chair to the maid, and and, and you, you feel conflicted and you fight it, and you maybe don't have food for two days in the house. But then you got to come back and you have to say that you know, okay, this is this is something that's irreconcilable for her. But you also see, like the lady there pointed out, and you the other side. I don't know how to fight it. I want to be able to fight it. Start to get home first, and I want your I want your answer. Okay, a policy for the home. These are really uh, searching, uh, profound questions, and I wish I had, we had time. I won't be able to do justice. I, 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 if I did, I'd take another 15, 20 minutes of doing to do that. So I'll just sort of answer very briefly uh, to some things that you said. Uh, you know, about the value thing, you know, uh, this was started off with the you know, reference to the 377 judgment and its overturning. One of the finest things that was, was written into uh, the High Court judgment really was the talk about constitutional values. What he said was that, uh, what the two judges said, I think was the most profound. You see, religious uh, you know, groups say that it goes against our morality. What he said was that we have to accept the consensus of a higher 
morality is the morality of the constitution. To which we need to subordinate our individual and our collective moralities. And we have to have a, the willingness to do that. And yesterday's judgment, I think, reversed that very profound uh, idea. Uh, and so I do believe that, that it is an achievable aspiration to understand what are, what is the consensual constitutional framework of values and it is under those values that we want to raise our children and to define ourselves. Uh, uh, so that, that was one. Uh, you talked about consistency and that's something that, that I struggled with all my life and I think a very imperfect example of, of, of consistency and fundamentals. My only dilemma is that, that there's some more tangible ways of consistency uh, in terms of what you care and, and in terms of we live in a middle class lifestyle, we don't have uh, a lifestyle of poverty by any means, and possibly one should. But I, you know, it's not a defense, but in my mind, uh, when I look around at my friends, many of us engage with these struggles, I think the most profound lifestyle question is your relationship. How do you look at a person of, 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 of disadvantage? Do you really respect them fully as, a, as an equal human being? And I've learned over time that that's something instinctive and that's why the child uh, who uh, I engage with actually knows I love the child uh, you know, in, 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 in his or her fullness. If I sit with a homeless person, I'm able to relate without any difficulty because actually I value that person, I respect that person, there's no questions. And to my mind, perhaps that's the more, most difficult lifestyle question. Uh, you have to see this. Uh, Mahatma versus Gandhi to, to look at some of the questions of consistency. And I think it was one of the most profound philosophical uh, plays that I saw. The film was not so good. If Gandhi and his son had this conversation, his son died about four months later, uh, 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 an unclean body uh, on the streets of Bombay uh, with syphilis and uh, alcohol and so on. And they're having a conversation in, 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 in heaven. And he says, you know, Gandhi could, nobody could be more consistent than Gandhi. So, so Gandhi is bringing up his son in a, in, in a village school. And the son wants to be a barrister like his father. So his father says, there's no question, I give you all this up. Somebody comes and says, I'm giving you a donation uh, uh, for your son's education. You're so great. Uh, I, I'll sponsor his travel to uh, studies to. So Gandhi, without even talking to him, calls a meeting of the village says, everybody here is my son, so somebody else, Chaganwal, is going to go us. And he never forgave him, and he slipped more and more into bitterness, etc. So I think the consistency questions are really complex. At one level, he was extremely consistent, but was his, you know, not for his son, the way it should have been, should his son, his son said, you are a barrister. Uh, you had all the life chances. You can make your choices for me. Let me make my own choices. Give me the same opportunities. And then let me decide. So I think those are very difficult questions. Uh, and lastly about compassion. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, I keep... You know, I, I, the word I really like to use is egalitarian compassion. And it's something very, very different from... Uh, you know, it's a space where both of us can care for each other. And I'll end with the lack of the story very briefly. Uh, I, uh, you know, we tried to bring together children from uh, my uh, from my daughter's school, uh, Shiram, and our kids. And I said, let's get a five-day camp together. But it's not going to be a charity place. They're not coming to your school. They should come to us. And I, I spent actually those most of those five days. It was a really fascinating encounter because initially. Both sets of kids were sort of very nervous of each other. My kids were sort of hiding somewhere because they thought they would be treated disrespectfully. And those kids thought, I can spend five days with a bunch of ruffians, you know, what's going to happen, etc. And gradually, so the first meeting, I put them together and said, let's talk about what you like and don't like. So very quickly, they start talking about the same film stars and okay, then they start together. But the differences were very interesting. Uh, our kids, from a mood, said what they love most in the world is going to school. And the Sri Lankan kids are going to hate who is just going to school, etc. So that was interesting. But the next exercise we had was actually having one-to-one -one conversations where we said one Sri Lankan kid and one Indian kid would actually talk to each other about their lives. And that's where empathy was just, and did that as an example. And I happened to be sitting, you know, and I heard one conversation which just went to the depths of my heart. Because 
the Sridhar girl was actually talking to this Umid boy about some things that I doubt she'd ever have spoken to her own friends. She was talking about how the father doesn't care about her and doesn't have time for her. And here was my Umid boy counseling her, saying, you know, you know, you know, give your father a chance, you know, maybe he's not able to show it, and at least you have a father. So I think, and, you know, that's compassion to me. Uh, it's not about, you know, it's not about somebody superior doing something. Thank you, Mari. I think you're on the ovation as possible. <laughs> Someone to make a few comments. Actually, I found the discussion fascinating because I think together that we became a collective middle class study of our doubts and passions. And I think that is really what made Harsh interesting because he's as full of contradictions as we are, but he has maybe gone further in trying to solve them. I do know that when I take my shuffle driven car home and at the red lights, I might give the beggar 15 rather than 5 rupees. And that is my contribution. And we escape it. I don't know. But I think what's nice is even if you don't have paradigms as yet, because I don't think compassion creates paradigms, the I am guy who is compassionate is still going to practice the same Montek economics. And we change the categories. And I think there is a fundamental problem. How do we move from exemplars like us to paradigms for a different kind of society? But I think in raising these questions, whether from the level of the Bhakti cult or from the level of IIM, I think Harsh has performed an important function. Which is why, even when I quarrel with him, I have to respect him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harsh and uh, Shiv, for this evening. Um, as uh, we have found that you know, it's, it, the question is not just uh, in terms of its magnitude, it's problematic in terms of its complexity. We are all dealing with doubts. That is one thing that we have uh, kind, of, uh, kind of jointly arrived at. We are, in our everyday life we are dealing with doubts and you know, there's no end to that. But still, that aspiration to, to be compassionate is something which, which we will have to nurture perhaps. And also this whole question of how do we deal with our time and how do we give our time is more important. But that's this question of time, which we really dealt with in the, uh, in the lecture by uh, Sundar Sarukai. You know, we, are, we were talking about time and understanding time. And giving time is also an act of compassion. Perhaps uh, getting into that understanding is perhaps a way of individually kind of trying to deal with this question. Thank you very much. And while I say this, like, you know, trying to develop this kind of a discourse, I uh, would also urge all of you to go to our website and see the feedback form there. We are trying to find out, gather from the audiences that have been coming into our lectures, you know, what are the ways of uh, going about it? How are we con going to continue this discourse? Please participate in this whole exercise because it's a democratic exercise that we are trying to uh, you know, initiate here. Please go there and fill in this feedback form so that we, we get more ideas to deal with this question. And then solidarity can be actually built from bottom up. Thank you very much.